God never puts faith in the mental realm. He never says with the mouth one confesses, with the mind you believe. That's not what he says. Throughout the Bible, when it's talked about believing, trusting, having faith, it's always connected to the heart. Or if I put it more plainly, your spirit. Because faith is not something that happens in the natural realm. Faith is something that happens in the spiritual realm. It's in another dimension. I want to talk to you about the subject of faith, the subject of faith. I want to look at it really uh, narrowed down from just one viewpoint and specifically of the life of J. Iris and how faith was needed to raise dead things back to life. I don't know if you have some things that maybe have lost hope or you feel like you're not going to make it. I want you to know that God is the God who raises dead things back to life. But there is a desire on your part to have faith. Can I get an amen from the people of God? Some of y'all are visiting. We're at an amen church. I love for you to talk back. Let, let me help you out. If you talk back, the sermon goes quicker, okay? It's true. It's true. Because if you don't say amen, I figure you didn't get it, so I need to give one more illustration. So we just keep going illustration till I get... Since I didn't get an amen, it was later. Let me give you another illustration. So my wife doesn't do a lot of cooking. I do most of the cooking in the family. But when she does cook, I definitely am like, mm, this is so good. Mm, right? I'm just, now why are you doing that, Pastor? Because I want her to cook again. Y'all get it? Okay. So, you, you know, when I'm doing some cooking, give me a little amen. All right, here we go. So God is the God that brings dead things back to life, and he wants to do that in your life. But there is a requirement for you to have faith. Everything in the kingdom of God is received by grace, meaning you didn't earn it and you didn't deserve it. That God, out of his unmerited favor, his loving kindness, gave you a gift. But it's not just a gift that can sit on the counter. you got to open the package. And the way you open the package is by faith. You know, my, my uh, daughter, youngest daughter, is having a birthday today. And her grandmother, my mom, came over, and she brings a lot of gifts. We don't, in fact, we don't buy gifts for our kids because Mimi, uh, my mom, does enough gifts. We don't want to have that many toys. So at least that's my excuse, <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> oh, I got the dust there. Woo, you're not even a teenager yet. You're only 12. Well, come on now, girl. All right, so she's 11, going to be 12. And... Um, where was I? I? I got that face from you. It, it threw me off. Don't give me that face again, all right? <laughs> but, but Olivia, when, when all the gifts came in, she, wanted, she didn't want to eat the meal. She didn't want to do the cake. She wanted to open the gifts. And it's, it's really ridiculous in the body of Christ that we want to do everything else except for open the gift that God's given us. We want to sing the songs, we want, to, we want to look the religious walk, but we don't want to actually dive into what salvation, what righteousness looks like, right? But the way you dive into that is by faith. And so I want to look at this beautiful passage of a guy named Jairus who had faith to watch his daughter rise from the dead. And what are some aspects that we can learn from this so that we can grow in our faith? It, many of y'all know this story. J. Iris goes to Jesus, and he's, he, he, it, you know, Jesus at this point is an upstart rabbi. He's not somebody that's well known, but what he is known for is healing people. And so J. Iris falls at his feet and says, Teacher, can you, can you heal my daughter? She's at the point of death. And on the way over to J. Iris' house, many of you know this story, a, a woman with the issue of blood touches Jesus, and she's immediately healed. And they begin to explain the story. Well, as the story's getting explained, J. Iris gets interrupted. And in Mark, the fifth chapter, the 35th verse, it says this. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of J. Iris, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher. Now, isn't that true many times when you're going through a situation that you find that the situation goes from bad to worse? Yes. Uh, have you ever been in a place where like the washing machine broke down and then you got fired from your job and you're like, God, where were you on that one, right? And see, what you don't understand is the moment that you step out. See, Jairus stepped out to trust in this guy named Jesus. The moment you step out, you can expect a challenge. Satan is an intimidator. And, and he's, not, he's not intimidated by you saying, yes, I'm going to believe. He gets intimidated when you follow through with your belief. I'll give you an example of this. When we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedjigo. Oh, no, that's, that's how my dad taught me it growing up. Uh, 
right? You got these three Hebrew boys, and they go up against Nebuchadnezzar, and they say, we ain't bowing. And he says, you're going in the fiery, fiery furnace, right? Now, why does Nebuchadnezzar say, well, let's turn it up seven times hotter? Why? Because the fire, if I'm a reasonable person, I can do math, two plus two is four, right? The fire at one level is going to burn you to death just like the fire at another. Maybe one happens a little faster, but you're going to die. Why does he turn it up? Why does he kill his own men? Because Satan is an intimidator. Know this about his tactic, his strategy. Anytime you say yes to Jesus, many of you are getting baptized today. You're going from death to life. You're joining Jesus' team today. I know you're wanting the dove to come out of the heavens, but we only got seagulls here, so don't expect it. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm keeping that one for later. But Satan will intimidate you. He'll bring out the fire. He'll make it hotter. It's just, uh, it's just like you get diagnosed with cancer. You come down. We pray for you. We anoint you with oil for healing. You believe you got touched. You believe you're healed. You go back to your doctor. Your numbers are higher. I, I thought you were, were going to heal. And right, you don't understand the strategy. He's going to turn it up. Do you believe? Jairus is going through the same test. So what does Jesus say to Jairus? And this will be my first point. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Look at your neighbor and say, no fear. No fear. That's point number one. Then Jesus stopped the crowd uh, and wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, James, and John, who was the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this com uh, commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. they laughing at Jesus. That's crazy. But he made them all leave. Look at your neighbor and say, get out. Get out. That's going to be my third point. Get out is my third point. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, uh, he said to her, Talith kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone uh, what had happened. And then he told them to take her to Whataburger. And... <laughs> No, y'all yeah, read it up there. All right, I want to unpack this three things that I think are really powerful for you to understand, for you to walk in faith, for you to open up the gifts, the good things that God has for you. The first thing I need you to understand is you got to have no fear. My grandfather says it like this. He have a scale uh, where one goes up and one goes down, and he says it like this: When your fear is high, your faith is going to be low. But if you want high faith, you got to decrease the fear. See, you can't have high faith and high fear. You're going to have one or the other. And here's the beautiful thing. God is, he's, he's, uh, he hammers this throughout the scriptures for you not to have fear when you're walking through your trial. You, you got to catch this because many believers think they can run around just being scared and hopefully God does something. That's not how it works. In fact, 365 times in the Bible, the scriptures will say, don't have fear. If God told us for every day there is a, 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 in the year to not have fear, it's probably pretty important for us to, not to walk in fear. So how would, you, how would you overcome fear? I know my grandfather, uh, when he was in ministry, there was, there was a point where he was struggling a lot. And, and they weren't able to pay the salaries, the, the, the people working there. And so they counted the offering. They looked at it. They, he, he was like, that's not enough. And so he pulled them all in the office and he said, hey, guys, I just got to tell you, we're not going to be able to make payroll this month. We need to pray. And, you know, he said people got really serious when their, when their payroll was on the line. So everybody started praying in that office. They just started seeking the Lord and, and, and saying, God, we trust you. You're our provider. And they heard a knock at the door that day. And the secretary went to the door, and, and she opened the door, and there was somebody with a check. And it was the exact amount they needed to cover. See, what were they doing? And I need you to catch this. Anytime you have fear, you have the ability 
to pray to God so that you can overcome that anxiety, that worry. In fact, Scripture gives us prescription for this in Philippians, the fourth chapter. It says this, don't worry about uh, anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Now, I have a little issue with the translators. It says, thank Him for all He has done. But in the Greek, it doesn't say for past tense. You can actually thank Him for all He's done. You can thank Him for all He's doing. You can thank Him for all He's about to do. Can I get an amen from the people of God? That's more literal to the translation, the Greek there. So, so you have this prayer that has thanksgiving going on. When you do this, watch what happens. Then you will experience God's Peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I need you to catch this. That when you go to the Lord with proper prayer, not just any prayer, but proper prayer, you will receive in return a peace that goes above what you can think. So you're like, I don't know how the math's going to work. I don't know how my bills are going to get paid. How, how can God make this happen in me? But when you seek him with a true prayer, he'll give you something on the inside that, contra- that goes above what goes up on here, right? Let me make this even more plain. God never puts faith in the mental realm. He never says with, you know, with the mouth one confesses, with the mind you believe. That's not what he says. Throughout the Bible, when it's talked about believing, trusting, having faith, it's always connected to the heart. Or if I put it more plainly, your spirit. Because faith is not a natural, uh, uh, something that happens in the natural realm. Faith is something that happens in the spiritual realm. It's in another dimension. Y'all okay? Okay. Y'all know how this works. No amens. I keep going. There we go. Thank you. So let me, let me keep going on this because it's, it's, it's crucial you get this. What is proper prayer? prayer? It's a prayer with thanksgiving. So I've done this. I'm just going to pick on myself today so you don't think I'm picking on you. I've gone to the Lord and said, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This ain't going to make it. Ah, help me, Jesus, right? And I'm not praying I'm worrying and calling it prayer. Prayer is this. You go to the Lord and say, God, I know you. I thank you for saving me today. God, I thank you that when I was in a situation like this, you paid my bills last time. God, I thank you that it says in your word that uh, uh, you've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bed, right? Uh, Begging for bread. And and so here's, here's the beautiful thing, my friends. When you begin to say, God, I just thank you and you have a thankful heart God says that's the attitude of prayer that gets results. And as you're praying, you're seeking Him. You're discovering who He is. As that's happening, you're also falling in in love with Him. Didn't we sing that song today about, man, let me fall back in love with my first love, right? Now, what is that about? Instead of going to God with some formal list about you need to do all these things so I can have a better day, you're spending time with him, thanking him for who he is, and you're discovering how much he loves you. That, how much he loves you. That love that he has for you then overflows where you begin to love him. Y'all catching that? We don't love God. Because mama told you to. Scripture says we love God because he first loved us. So that love that he's given us begins to transform us. Means it changes us. Where you're not, not like Hollywood love, agape love, unconditional love. Jesus says what good is it if you love somebody that loves you, right? Even sinners do that. You're not special if you love your wife because she made the coffee and did your laundry. You're like, I love her because she does all the things, right? No, you, you show that you're a, a believer, a Christian, when you love somebody who's not treating you well. All church hurt would be solved right there in that statement. Well, they just ain't treat me right. If they just treat me right, right? And I'm like, man, you ain't... Listen, my friends, I know we got a lot of visitors. But... And, I, I, we do have a lot of visitors. Let me go through this. Sorry. Y'all did give me amen, so this ain't on you. In the beginning, 
He's like, man, he went to Genesis, right? <laughs> How long are we going to be here? God said, let us create mankind in our image. In the image of God, he created them. Now, what is that image? Without going throughout all of it, it's love. It's love. John says God is love. And that's what you were created to be in the garden. But see, we went to self-preservation, self-seeking behavior. And because of selfishness, because we pursued after our own, we were cut off from the love because of sin, and we started to seek after each other. That's why they saw each other naked, because they were lusting after each other instead of loving each other. And Jesus came and died on the cross, not just so you can get to heaven. That's why you never hear here, say the prayer to get to a location. Because we believe that when you say, I want to join your team, Jesus, for y'all getting baptized today. When you say, yes, Jesus, you're going to go down in the water as Romans 6, as Christ went down in the grave. And you're coming up a new person. So you're no longer, I'm just a sinner that's going to barely make it in. No, I'm the righteousness of God. I'm a child of God. That's who he's called me to be. I can walk in love. I can, be, I can walk in unconditional love, and it's amazing, right? Yeah. And you'll find the greatest sense of peace, purpose, and joy in that type of life. Yeah. Anytime that trade out, he's been depressed. I, just, I threw it out for everybody. Again, I'm just picking on myself today. Anytime that trade out, he's been depressed, it's because I've been thinking about Trey. Right. 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 But when I live for his great name and I live for others... I find that there is a joy that is unspeakable. Now, why is that devotion, that love to God so important? Because you become unconditional love, which means that you can say now, I don't care what happens to me. Oh, we got silent on that part. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of his testimony, don't stop there, and we love not our lives even unto death. So you become transformational love just like Stephen was when they threw stones at him and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How is he able to represent exactly what Jesus looked like on the cross? Because he didn't just say a prayer to get to heaven one day. He said a prayer to be transformed. He believed in a person that changes his life, right? Can I get an amen from somebody today? This is powerful. If you catch this, you'll understand the Christian faith. Too many people are believing for faith just to move a mountain instead of faith to become like Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you become love, then perfect love, what does it do? It casts out all fear. Worry has no place. Anxiety has no place. So he says to Jairus, don't have any fear. Just believe, right? They can't coexist together. One's got to stay. One's got to go. When he does this, I love this because Jesus walks into the house. When he walks into the house, he says, she ain't dead. She's just sleeping. Now, if we had got any main, mainstream news media's fact checkers and said, hey, can we fact check this on Jesus? We, we posted a story with Jesus with Pinocchio nose, right? Since that's a little, that's too touchy. If we just put a doctor in, the doctor went up, checked the girl's pulse, and said, no, Jesus is lying right now. So is he lying or is he seeing something in a different realm? So faith supersedes facts here. Truth is greater than what the natural realm can produce. You got to see this. Truth is eternal. It, it says that, that the things we see, these things are passing away. These things are fading. But the truth will remain forever. So Jesus was able to see on a realm of truth that changed the situation. So for you to walk in faith, you got to put on some Jesus sunglasses. Come on, point number two, put on his glasses. You got to see it like Jesus sees it. In, in, doesn't Jesus do this with Lazarus? He, they're like, he's, he's like, Lazarus is just sleeping. And they're like, okay, well, we can wait around. No big deal if he's just sleeping. He's like, man, you guys aren't catching it. He's dead, but I'm going to raise him from the dead, right? right? 
He had to explain these things because they couldn't see in the spiritual. So when you learn how to see things in the spiritual realm, what seems like, to, uh, seems like a problem, you're going to see promise because you have a different perspective. You don't see a dead girl. You see something that's about to come to life. You don't see a bankruptcy. You don't see a divorce. What you see are dead things coming back to life. The doctor diagnoses you with a sickness. You don't see the sickness. Now, I'm not saying you deny it. What you're saying is there's a greater truth, a greater reality that supersedes what's happening in my natural body right now. So with this, with this, Jesus comes in and says this. But here's the beautiful thing. Abraham was able to do this too. And why was Abraham able to believe and see things on a different realm? And, and I love this. In Romans, the fourth chapter, the 16th verse, Romans, the fourth chapter is all about the faith of Abraham and how the faith of Abraham uh, made him right with God. And it says in verse 16, so the promise, talking about righteousness re revealed through Jesus Christ, is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to get it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. Look at your other neighbor and say, Abraham's my daddy. Sorry, sorry. Verse 17. That is what the scripture means when God told him, I made you the father of many nations. This happened, now watch this, I want to key in here. Because Abraham believed in the God who brings dead things back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. So Abraham got to this place with God where he understood his character, his nature. He knew about him in such a way that he could trust him with his life. And not only his life, but his son's life. Come on, you're not, you're not giving somebody something you don't trust them, right? I mean, like, I'll give you an example. I trust my wife. Like, we have, we, we married. We have a joint pool of money. We can both pull from it, right? I, you all have access to that. You don't have access to my checking account. You say, why not, Pastor? I don't trust you. And some of you, you don't, you don't even give your spouse access to your truck because you know them, right? That's a whole other story. I'm going to leave that alone. He went there. He shouldn't have gone there. All right, so you get to know this wonderfully amazing, good God. And you find out he is good. In fact, like I'll hear atheists, he's, he's a child killer. He's offering Isaac on the altar, right? And I'm like, you didn't read Hebrews then. They don't. They don't read Hebrews. They just read the, the story in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. What does Hebrews say? Hebrews gives us some insight of what Abraham was thinking. Yeah. Now, he's either crazy or he knows God. Because in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 19th verse, it says, Abraham reasoned within himself. Yeah. Now, what does reason mean? It means two plus two is what? Four. It means with the evidence, you suppose a certain outcome. So the evidence he had is what? He believed, he reasoned within himself that God, even, even if he offered Isaac on the altar, God was able to raise him from the dead. Now, why is that? Because God said, you're going to be a father of many nations through this dude Isaac. That's what God told him. And he knew God couldn't lie. So he knew if this happened, God's got to still fulfill the bargain. So he's going to have to raise Isaac from the dead. Oh, y'all not catching this. I need you to catch this. So this God we worship is amazingly good. In fact, Jesus talks about that. He says, you know, when you worry, like, like you, you seek after, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? He says, the Gentiles, they worry about these things. You don't need to worry about this. And, and he says, why? he tells us why. Because you have a heavenly father who knows what you need. So he immediately says that you have a good daddy that takes care. Since I got my daughter on the front row, you ever had to beg me for food? Thank you. Thank you for answering right. <laughs> now, she's maybe had to ask me to cook, but you, you ever had to ask to get in the refrigerator to get some food? No. 
you just go in there, get the snacks you want, huh? Unless daddy's telling you, she's, she's saying yes for everybody over on this side. I'll pay you later. All right. <laughs> now, a good father is very generous with all that he owns. Heavenly Father is no different. I'm not making this up. That's what, that's, if you look at the parable of the, the lost sons, remember what he says to the son that's been there the whole time? Son, all that I have is yours. And when you get to know God, not what pastor teaches about God, not what you heard on TikTok from some prophet, right? When you actually get to know God by spending time in his word and being in the secret place with him, you're going to find out he's crazy good. And that's why it's so important you spend one-on-one -on -one time with God. I'm grateful you came to church today. You did amazingly well. Awesome. But you got to learn how to close the door behind you and talk to God just you and him. Nobody else knows about it. Because when you do that, it's developing faith within you. You say, how's it developing faith? See, if you come here, there's a lot of ulterior motives that could be working. Your subconscious could think, well, I got to go to church or somebody's going to be mad at me. Maybe your wife drug you to church. Maybe you lift your hands so people think you're spiritual. There's a lot of things that could be going on, mixed emotions in your heart. But when you're just alone with God and you close the door, nobody knows about it. One of two things is happening. Either you're crazy and you talk to the air or God shows up. One of the two. So in that place, faith is developing. You're talking to the air, but you're believing you're talking to the creator of the universe who shows up. And you do it every day. And some days you don't get a shaka. You don't, you know, you're not listening to YouTube and you're like, oh, whoa, the, the music was just right. I felt the spirit. Sometimes it's 5 a.m. You don't feel nothing. You're fasting caffeine. You're like, I don't know why I did that. Right. And you're like, Jesus, help me. I don't feel you right now. But you know what? My wife said it's not about the feelings, right? Love is a commitment that's found in choice. You do that over and over and you're going to find that, that God's showing up in crazy ways. But not just he's doing things around you. Your mind is going to change where you look at things that used to seem impossible and now it seems like a foregone conclusion. See, when you get to a place in your life where others are saying that's crazy, that's impossible, and you can just see the miraculous, you don't have to, you're not manufacturing it, you're not conjuring it up, but it's a natural response after spending time with them. That's when you know you've been changed. Uh, I remember um, I, I was, uh, I, I'd been seeking the Lord and I was going through this, this challenging season. I'd wrecked my vehicle. I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get the money needed to cover the, uh, the deductible. And then on top of that, I, uh, I drove over to my mom's house. We're headed up to a meeting. I remember it so clearly. Susan Richardson's woman's meeting. And I get a call from my employer. And he says, we got to let you go. And so now I'm in this place where I'm trying to figure out how am I going to pay rent? How am I going to fix my car? How, it, it, like, again, when it rains, it pours. There's, there's always an intimidation. It's always turned up. And I remember stepping out of that car after talking to my mom, and I, and I just said these words. I didn't have to make it happen because I knew it was the right answer. Catch this Bible-believing people. Because a lot of times we're like, I know what I'm supposed to do because that's faith. Or, and so we operate out of principle instead of presence. So I wasn't doing it because I knew this is what I was supposed to do to get God to work on my behalf. I had spent time with him, and so I step out of the car, and what produces on my tree, I say, Mom, I know that when God closes one door, he's going to open another. And God just supernaturally worked on my behalf financially, not because I was living by a place of principle, but because I got into his presence. There's too many people trying to live faith on principle. Now, I, get, I got it. We need to learn about the aspects of faith and all that. But I promise you, if you just spend time with him, he'll tell you what to do. That's good preaching, Pastor. If you're visiting, you're like, man, this pastor, he seems a little prideful. Um, I do work on that. Okay, so... Uh, Amen. I'm funny, right? I'm funny. I got that going. I found out 
uh, never mind. I don't leave that alone. So I had some stories about my children, but I got one on the front row, so I got to keep them quiet today. So, all right. The last thing I want you to see here in this this story of J. Iris is notice he kicks out everybody that doesn't believe. My friends, you got to learn how to cast out the critic. And many times, you know, we think of the critic as somebody that's talking, a hater, you know, a, a Facebook post or, or something that happened on Instagram, right? But, but really, I find the biggest critic that I have to deal with on a daily basis is right between my ears. That critical voice that always tells me I'm not good enough, you're not going to make it, I can't believe God really called you, right? We all deal with some level of criticism within our own head. And it is very important you learn how to cast out that critic. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew, the 12th chapter, when talking about casting out devils, he says there was a spirit that was cast out of a man and that spirit wandered in desert places or dry places. And he picked up seven demons more worse than... He was like, man, I'm, this is a bad place. Let me go get seven of my friends and go check out my old haunt. So he goes back to his place and he finds it swept clean and ready to enter. It's like a turnkey now at this point. And Jesus says they all enter and the state of the man is worse than it was in the first. And I need you to catch this, that if you cast out the critical spirit without putting something within you'll find that it doesn't really work. That's why Romans, the 12th chapter, talks about a renewal that has to happen in your mind so that when you hear a thought that's not of God's, you take it captive. In fact, Romans, the 12th chapter, the second verse, y'all going to finish this sermon early. These two ladies <laughs> on the front row. Anybody here that wants to end early, you can thank them later, okay? <laughs> right up here. Amen. Jeanette and Stacy, they're right here. They take offerings too if you want to bless them. <laughs> Romans 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I want to, I want to stop here for everybody getting baptized today. I want you to catch this. Not only are you, you brand new on the spirit man, you're going to need to read the Bible so that you're brand new in the way you think. Yes. Yes. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So if you learn how to fill yourself with the word of God, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to go through the trials, the tests, the challenges of life, and as you're doing it, you're going to take everything that is not what God's saying captive. It, you know, that, that thought that says, well, you're, just, you're going to fail. You're always a failure. You're never going to make it. You, you failed last time. And instead of hearing that voice, you're going to say, my Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, you, man, there's no way you're going to make it financially. You just, I, my, God, my Bible says that my God shall provide for me according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. See, when you begin to renew your mind, you're going to hear thoughts that are not of God and you're going to challenge it. I want you to know this, that your pastor, me, I receive thoughts all the time that are not God. Uh, you know, I'm driving down the seawall. Hit that person, you can get four points. <laughs> And that's the thought I tell you, okay? That's the thought I tell you, right? But instead of rolling with that thought, I challenge that thought. Everybody was created in the image of God. There's value, purpose in that life. See, I don't just let it roll. I don't just laugh it off. I challenge it. Because I've been called to think differently. So anytime there's something that comes up, I'm, I'm so in the Word that I will challenge what is brought to me. It's important you see this, because many of you are just, you think if you think it, it's got to be you. See, my friends, you, uh, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you keep them from building a nest, come on, I love this. We got the kids coming up, loving Jesus. Yeah. You know it's a Bible service that the kids are coming to the altar. Praise God. Flip-flops, that means we're an island church. It's just prophetic. It's prophetic right now.
praise God. But there's this, um, there's this heart in, in God. He praise God, he's good. But there's this heart in God where you begin to hear his voice and think like him. Think like him. And then you hear these voices, and instead of just allowing it to roam, you know, man, i got to kick this out if I want to see the dead come back to life. Y'all are with me. I can, I can sense it even without the amen. So let's praise God. So let me close on this story. So I come here to pastor December 2010, and things aren't working out like I thought they would. Five years as pastoring, it's a grind, it's a struggle. I thought God promised these, these amazing promises. Why am I not seeing them? In fact, in your living groups, you're going to go over this, this scripture in Hebrews, faith and patience inherit the promises. It's so important that you learn how to be patient in trusting God. And you'll go through that to, with, your home, with your Jesus groups. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in the struggle, but instead of being patient, I get heart sick. I get disappointed. And the disappointment doesn't necessarily show up outwardly. It's actually very inward. It's, it's, it's a sin that I can't shake. It's, a, it's an addiction. And, and normally, like, I, I could confess it, walk away, but I'm finding it's, it's just a little too much. It's too strong. And, and, and then there's the problem now because now I got this, this burden that I can't shake. And I got these words from this, this, the Bible in James where it says, Not many of you be teachers. Because there's a greater judgment, there's a greater condemnation coming for those teachers. So I got now this struggle where I got sin in my closet and I'm trying to teach and disciple the people of God. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I remember coming to the end of the year 2015 and I said this, I said, I may not be able to pastor, I may not be any good at it. And some of you probably are agreeing with that today after my preaching. And I, that's okay. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Except for you two. Praise God. It's like you're going to be so serious and ruin the moment, Pastor. Oh, I know. I love you. My wife says that all the time. Anyway. Uh, I said, I may not be able to pastor, but I know I can be close to God. And so I just began to seek Him. As I began to seek Him with fair, prayer and fasting... He began to lead me. He led me down this road of, of seeing this guy named Todd White with dreadlocks and then Todd White's pastor, Dan Moeller. In the midst of this, I'm, I'm hearing this teaching that I'm right with God. Not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did. I'm not, I'm not 50% right trying to get the other 50%, but that God sees me as righteous. In fact, he brought out this scripture in Colossians. God sees you as holy, as blameless, and above reproach. You hear me, Adam? It's how God sees you. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. And he said, you need to see yourself that way. And so I said, I'm going to do this. And so I'd get up in the morning. I'd look in the mirror. I'd say, God, you see me as holy, blameless, and above reproach. And then I'd have the critic right after that. Yeah, but what about that thing you did? What about that, that look you gave your wife? What about this? And I'd confess that. I'd say, God, you know, forgive me for all that. And I'd say it again. I, God, I thank you. You see me as holy, blameless, and above reproach. And I kept just believing it and saying it and trusting in it, even when my life didn't look like it. And I said, God, I thank you that I'm right with you. I thank you that I'm holy right now. Some of you, some of you just need to look in the mirror and say, God, I'm holy. I'm cleaner than any Tide detergent could give me right now. I'm not clean, Pastor. If you accepted Jesus, now if you ain't accepted him, you're right, you ain't clean. But if you accepted him, I remind you what God told Peter in the book of Acts. Stop calling something unclean that God calls clean. And what I found is that my life began to produce what I believed. That I began to, to walk out this righteousness that he's provided for me. I opened that gift that's always been there for me to open. And it changed my life. Now I'm like, 
I go places and I love people, just not trying to, not because I'm a pastor. I got I to gotta love people, you know. <laughs> got to be nice to somebody. I look down, Jesus, I better do something today. No, I just go be. I just go to the... Go to Walmart and grocery store. In fact, we, uh, we were at Bulgaria, and there was another believer. He's been in the faith, and, and he watched me just pray for people. In fact, the waiter, I, I started off, they spoke English. If I found out they spoke English, I was like, free reign. I'm just going to blow it up. <laughs> but, I, you know, I just said, Jesus loves you. He's like, oh, you know, he just kind of taken back by it. Served her food, all this. I'm asking the Lord. I'm like, Lord, do you have like a, you have something in me you want me to pray? Is there, is there something specific? Does you have back injury? Is there, just tell me, Lord. And the Lord says, I'll tell you when it's time. And so he, he gives the bill to me and, and I normally, I tip the bill. Whatever the bill is, I just double it. It's a good, great way to witness to waiters. Great way to witness to waiters. You say, I can't afford that. Then go to the cheap places and then cook a lot. Right, Sophia? We cook a lot. But I go there, I, I, I say, oh, hey, I want to double this. He's freaking out. He's like, what? I, I, I was going to have to quit my job because, and then he began to explain his sickness. And I was like, man, Jesus, just put it up on a silver platter for me. And after he explained it, I said, you know what? I believe in the God who heals. Jesus wants to heal you right now, that sickness. And we got to pray there at the table, just just be Jesus right there. All I, you know, I just ate pizza and I was Jesus. It was fun. Amen. I wasn't like, oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I need faith, right? I just spent time with him. He's awesome. I want to be that to others. So we pray with him, and the person across, he's like, wow. And now he's been forever changed. In fact, he's texting me. He's like, I was at the farmer's market praying for people. And he's like, wow, I didn't know I could live this way as a believer. And if you've, never, if you've never prayed for somebody, let me help you. You live in a state, I, I promise you. Hey, see, she even agrees. Eight out of ten people, eight out of ten people will let you pray for them. One out of ten will say, no, I'm okay. And then about one out of ten may challenge you or say you're stupid or whatever. And you just, Jesus says, just dust the feet and keep rolling, okay? Eight out of ten are going to be like, yes. Now, they may not expect you to pray right there and then, but 8 out of 10 are going to say yes, and then you just pray. Let God work. And what you're going to find is, wow, this, this thing called Christianity is more than just attending a church on Sunday. And it's fun, and God will set up things for you. He'll put things on a silver platter. And you're like, I don't know. I can't do that. I'm just, ah, right? But I watch my wife do it. I mean, we have... Sometimes I get convicted because she's like praying for 10 people and I'm like, I'm only two, Jesus, help me, right? <laughs> but she went from this person that wasn't doing that at all to now a person that's like, we go everywhere. And, and normally, if it's a guy, she's like, that one's you. I'm like, all right, I'm on it, I'm on it. <laughs> it makes life fun. If your life's not fun, I ask, one, are you spending time with them? Because don't do this without spending time with them. Then it's just a work-based thing. Are you spending time with him? And then two, are you, what are you doing with what he's giving you? That changed my life. Can I get an amen from the people of God? We all bow our heads together today. You know, I never want to close this service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. We have many people that have committed their lives to him and are getting baptized. I can't think of a better day to say, you know what? I want to say yes to Jesus. Are you tired of living for self? Has sin got you down? I want you to know there is, there is a person named Jesus Christ who loves you right where you're at. He's not looking at your past. He's not looking at your mistakes. He's just looking for a willing heart to say yes, to open up this free gift of salvation he's put before you. I'm talking about more than just saying a prayer to get to heaven. While it involves an afterlife. It involves spending eternity with Him. It also means that heaven comes inside of you right now, where He transforms you. He makes you what Scripture would call a new creation. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God for a first time, or maybe you want to rededicate your life. You know, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I gave my heart to the Lord at a young age, but through a series of disappointments, I strayed away from God. And in 2001, through many prayers of my mama, and invites from my dad 
I went back to church and I rededicated my life to him. I was changed in that moment, never to be the same. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God for a first time or you want to rededicate, I want you to just raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you today. Anybody here? Yeah, I see those hands. Yeah. Day of new beginnings, day of a fresh start. Some of you are saying, well, when I get my life right, then I'll say yes. My friends, you're a good Galvestonian. You know you have to catch a fish before you clean it. And when you come to God, He does the work of cleaning you off. Anybody else? Day of new beginnings. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. God, I just ask that you would wash us clean in the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross for us in our place. And you're now seated at, uh, you rose again and you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And God, you're more than a God. You're now our Father. Teach us and guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us to a place of overflow. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, can you all make this confession with me? Say, Jesus is Lord. I believe with that simple prayer and confession, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. I want to give you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.